Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our regional webinar. Uh, my name is Carlos Verdugo. I'm a senior agronomist for the whole region. And today we have a very special guest. We have Dr. Frank Ventrup, who is one of our main scientists based in Germany. And the title of his presentation is Ammonia Emissions Impact on Climate, Environment, and Human Health. So as a short introduction, Frank is a doctor in agricultural science from the University of Hanover in Germany. His PhD was, or his PhD thesis was mainly about the environmental impact of arable crop production. And he is working for Yara since 1996. Now he's part of the strategic R&D team under the BU Food Chain and Global Solutions. Um, so his main topic or specialist or focus of a specialist is environmental topics related to um, fertilization and agriculture in general. So without, uh, so Frank, thanks a lot for being here, sharing with us your knowledge, your experiences. And so the floor is yours, Frank. Thank you very much, Carlos. Um, and good morning to you. Good afternoon to colleagues that may join uh, from Europe, for example. Um, so my name is Frank Bentrup. I work as a senior scientist in our research center in the northwest of Germany, Hanninghof. And um, my topic today is about ammonia emissions and their impact on climate, environment, and human health. And before I go into the content, I would like to briefly describe uh, what you can expect from the next 40 minutes. An introduction, of course, and then I will talk a little bit about the sources and the quantities of ammonia emissions, um, their impacts on climate, environment, and human health, how we can improve the situation, uh, a little bit about regulations around ammonia emissions, and of course, I will finish with a summary. But before we start, uh, why talking about ammonia? Um, well, in, in Europe, ammonia emissions are really seen as a problem, as a big problem, especially related to agriculture. And you can see here some, some uh, snips from uh, websites, from the EU uh, Commission, from Germany, from Ireland, from the UK. And they all um, relate to ammonia emissions and the problems. For example, in the UK, there is a, a heading saying that the ammonia emissions rise in the UK, but other air pollutants uh, levels fall. And that means that the ammonia emissions bec um, get more and more into focus uh, for the politicians uh, from a regulation point of view. And agriculture, as we will see, is the main source of these emissions. What you can also see from the pictures showing some uh, cows and pigs and everything around agriculture. So ammonia emissions is um, something that we have to uh, consider in, in, because they are also related to the fertilizers. And, um, but let's start with what is ammonia. So ammonia is a compound of nitrogen and hydrogen, NH3. It's a gas, very volatile. It has, a, it has no color, but a very characteristic smell. And um, it's very common in nature and it's also widely used, uh, as we will see, uh, at high concentrations, it's caustic, it's uh, hazardous, it's, um, but this is only in a very concentrated form. It is globally produced in large amounts. So, for example, in 2018, the total industrial production of ammonia was 175 million tons. It's mainly produced to be used in agriculture, and it forms the basis of, in principle, all nitrogen-containing mineral fertilizers. And um, this is also what I would like to start with. So ammonia is the basis for the mineral nitrogen fertilizers. How is it produced? So in principle, the process is very, looks very simple. Um, we take nitrogen from the air. Of course, it needs to be concentrated, but it's abundantly available in the air in a non-reactive form. And two, we need, we need hydrogen. Uh, which is not uh, available as such, but it can be produced, for example, today mainly from natural gas, but also from partly from coal, like in China. 
um, in a steam reforming process. So that needs a lot of energy and, and also the feedstock gas itself. So that's the main energy consumption in this process. We need fuel for the pressure and for the heat. And then we can um, produce ammonia uh, by the so-called Harbour Bosch process. This ammonia is the basis for many fertilizers. It can also be used uh, by itself. So for example, in the US, anhydrous ammonia is liquefied, is um, injected directly into the soil uh, as a fertilizer, as a nitrogen source, but it can also be combined with um, CO2, which is produced during the ammonia uh, production process. So this is available at an ammonia plant. And if it's combined with a CO2, we can produce urea out of the ammonia. Well, we can also oxidize the ammonia with um, air or with the oxygen in the air, and then we, um, we can form nitric acid uh, in a liquid form. And this nitric acid is the basis for the nitrates, for ammonium nitrate, for example, or ammonium nitrate-based NPKs, as they are um, the focus of, of Yara. Although we produce any kind of uh, nitrogen fertilizers, as you may know, the let's say the, the focus and, and the, the core of our products is basically the nitrates for certain region, uh, reasons, and uh, I will come back to that. Um, for other forms of nitrogens, for multi-nutrient nitrogens, we need, of course, the natural minerals um, taken mainly from rocks or deposits uh, from, from the earth. So this is how it is produced in an indus industrial scale, and this is already available since about 100 years or more than 100 years. Uh, Yara, at that time, Norsk Hydro was the first company uh, that produced um, ammonia at an at a, um, industrial scale, but um, with a different process. So some years ago, in 2008, we, um, there were some yeah, uh, publications around the cent one century of ammonia synthesis and how this changed the world. So it's really an, an invention that uh, changed the world. It also got a Nobel Prize, uh, the, the people that invented this um, process. And what you can see from, from the graph on the right-hand side is it's a bit complicated, but the main message here is that um, it is estimated that about half of the global population is today um, fed by the Harbour Bosch produced nitrogen. So we could only sustain half of the population if this source of, of nutrients would not be available. So it's really a very key component of food security today and uh, probably also in future. However, on the other hand, as I indicated already in the beginning, there are some um, problems, some drawbacks uh, with ammonia. So it can be lost from the agricultural system uh, as ammonia, as a gas, although um, we produce um, the, uh, the, fertilizer, the, the fertilizer nitrogen in a form that is mainly ammonium or nitrate. But nevertheless, when this ammonium gets into contact with the soil, it can also form ammonia, so the gas from, uh, from the compound. And depending on the soil pH, it's more or less uh, ammonia that is formed and that can be lost to the atmosphere. Urea has a particular problem in this case, in this respect, because the uh, conversion of urea um, due to the hydrolysis of urea in, in the soil uh, to ammonium increases the pH close to the granule of, of the urea. So it creates its own local uh, alkaline environment, which leads to uh, the ammonia losses uh, from urea. And that's the reason why urea, even on an acidic soil, can lead to some uh, ammonia losses because it creates its own alkaline environment which you can see um, from the photograph. Okay, <clears throat> once the ammonia is lost, uh, it is part of the so-called cycle of reactive nitrogen in, in the environment. And there are different forms of, of nitrogen that is um, chemically reactive, so that uh, reacts with other compounds to form new forms of ammonia, uh, of, of nitrogen compounds. And you can see here in the middle of this, um, uh, scheme the ammonia compound that is lost from uh, from agriculture and what you can also see this does not stay as ammonia in, this, in, in the air it is converted to to other compounds like ammonium nitrate can also become ammonium sulfate it will um, travel uh, through the air it will be transported uh, by by wind and in particles it 
has different consequences and it is part of a very complex system that has some environmental and human health uh, implications that I will uh, come back to later. Okay, that's um, kind of introduction very briefly. What is it about? What is ammonia? And where is uh, the, the problem? And especially, as I said, in Europe, um, this is seen as an important air pollutant and therefore it's also regulated by certain uh, legislation by the European Union. But what are the main sources and what are the quantities we are talking about? So looking again into Europe where the say emission inventories are um, very precise and where uh, this um, this emission is is regulated and needs to be uh, needs to be calculated in its amounts then we can see from the official statistics that agriculture here indicated in green on the left hand side is by far by far the most important uh, source of ammonia emissions so 94 percent of the european ammonia emissions originate from agriculture there are some other sources like uh, waste uh, treatment, um, like uh, industrial processes that deal with ammonia, but it's all in principle negligible compared to, um, uh, to the ammonia emissions from agriculture. And within agriculture, and that you can see on the right hand side, it's the livestock farming that um, creates most of the problem in this case. 75% of the agricultural emissions are related to livestock mainly to manure management, manure application, but also from, from stables, from grazing, um, where you have uh, yeah, certain amounts of, of nitrogen uh, applied to the soil and lost as ammonia. But also the mineral fertilizer plays a role here. It is estimated that about 22% of the agricultural emissions are related to mineral fertilizers. And out of that, um, share about 70% is from urea and UAN. So this is the um, sources, so it's agriculture, and within agriculture it's the livestock, uh, and within the mineral fertilizer it's, it's the urea mainly. If we now look into the global distribution of the ammonia emissions, then we can see that there are certain hotspots uh, in, the, in the world, and um, they are indicated in the a red color or red and orange colors. It's expressed the ammonia emissions here in kilograms of nitrogen per hectare. And you can see that in some places there is more than 25 kilogram um, nitrogen per hectare emitted as ammonia, which is quite a quite a lot over one year. And you can see that these places are, for example, in, in Europe, uh, in uh, yeah around. Um, the Netherlands and the northwest part of, of Germany, so in the very livestock intensive areas. And the same is probably uh, true for the, for the places in, in um, Asia, where we can see in China, for example, a hotspot. Interesting is also in Africa, uh, there is, seems to be a hotspot in the middle of, of the um, rainforest area uh, in, in Africa. And the next um, graph shows that there are different reasons for these emissions. So the first map has shown the emission uh, intensity. And here we can see the dominant source of emissions. Uh, there are, of course, more sources, but here's always the, the most important source uh, translated into a color. And you can see that in Europe and also in uh, Latin America and North America and in Asia, it's always agricultural soils and manure management and agricultural soils include here, for example, also the grazing. So that is not that this does not mean that here the mineral fertilizers are the main source. It's, it's this um, emissions from a soil, which can derive from either manure application or from grazing of animals, but that is then counted as emissions from soils. Manure management means really housing systems, uh, manure storage systems, things like that. Um, the main source in these uh, central africa region where we have seen some high emission uh, spots is the burning of biomass and agricultural waste so this is also contributing to ammonia emissions but of course uh, the most let's say qu biggest quantity globally comes from the um, manure and, and livestock farming part if we look a little bit into the uh, trends and the future projections of the emissions, and here we have two pollutants uh, next to each other, both important air pollutants, it's NOx, 
So um, another contributor, for example, to fine dust and, and particle uh, creation and ammonia. And there you can see that um, the NOx emissions have increased tremendously during the, let's say, past 50 years plus. And this is mainly due to the increased use of fossil fuels, of um, traffic, uh, of transport emissions and, and all that. So NOx is mainly coming from, uh, from the burning of uh, diesel and, and petrol and so on. While the ammonia emissions are, as we have seen, mainly related to agriculture. And here we see um, that uh, in contrast to the NOx emissions, it's more, it seems to be much more difficult uh, to control these type of emissions. And the projection is that they will still increase until uh, 2050 in this um, projection. What are now the negative impacts uh, in, in more detail on the climate, on environment and on the human health? So let's start um, with a general picture. This is uh, a picture that shows the, first of all, the origin of the um, um, ammonia emissions related to mineral fertilizer now. So as I said, the main source is from, from urea and urea containing products. There we have a certain um, amount, uh, sh a certain share of emissions uh, of, of ammonia that is lost to the air. This ammonia then, as I said before, does not stay as ammonia in the air. It will combine with other compounds uh, that are emitted, for example, um, sulfur dioxides or uh, NOx emissions into compounds um, that are then transported uh, by, uh, by, by the wind to other areas. They will contribute to the pollution of the air. So for example, fine particles, dust, summer smoke, that's um, some uh, issues there where ammonia is related but they will not stay forever in the air. So they usually are transported over a certain distance, sometimes only a few hundred meters, sometimes up to a thousand kilometers. There's a gradient um, in, the, in, in the transportation, also depending on the, on the conditions, of course. But finally, they will get back to the surface and they will be deposited. And uh, when they are deposited, it depends where they are deposited, what is the consequence out of that. So for example, uh, deposition of um, of these emissions on the on the forest uh, will lead to a acidification of the forest and um, if this uh, acidification uh, exceeds a certain level the forest the trees will um, will also suffer from from that uh, process so that is related to acidification of soils if they deposit on an agricultural soil they will also lead to some acidification but they will at the same time also fertilize uh, the agricultural crop and in, in that case. So that is even a kind of positive effect and the acidification can also be counteracted by, for example, liming. But the problem is really if, if the deposition takes place on natural or semi-natural um, ecosystems. Then there's another issue which is called eutrophication and that's the enrichment of certain ecosystems of more natural ecosystems with, with nutrients and which can lead to an unwanted growth of certain um, plants and algae uh, if, it's, if it's related to water bodies, uh, but for example also in uh, terrestrial and land-based uh, ecosystems, uh, the nutrient input is, um, can be negative because uh, certain groups of plants are more promoted by the, by the nutrients than, than others that will uh, then uh, um, be extinct. And then we have uh, the last aspect, which is the climate change. And here it's more an indirect effect. And I'll come back uh, to that in a second. So ammonia emissions contribute to different problems, which are related to climate change, ecosystem damage, and human health. In terms of climate, it's important to, to uh, note that ammonia itself is not a greenhouse gas. So it's not, it has no global warming potential, like, um, for example, a CO2 or methane or N2O. But it has an indirect contribution to climate change because after deposition of the ammonia nitrogen, a fraction of this nitrogen is converted to N2O, which is a greenhouse gas, um, through processes which are called nitrification and denitrification. So it's, a called, it's called an indirect greenhouse gas. In terms of ecosystems, the ammonia or the products from, derived from, from the ammonia 
as I said, partly deposit on natural or semi-natural land or on water. And they are leading to eutrophication, to enrichment of nutrients with an unwanted plant or algae growth, or and to acidification. In terms of human health, ammonia and its reaction products become part of fine particle matter. So they are forming small particles in the air, which can create um, fine dust, uh, leading, for example, to summer smog events. If, if the weather conditions are um, in a certain way that uh, they are not transported uh, further, then it is known from certain cities, for example, um, that uh, there will be a, a kind of um, covering of, of a city or of a certain area with, uh, with air that is loaded uh, with fine particles and with uh, air pollutants. And ammonia plays an important role. And this can lead to problems uh, with respiration or even to diseases uh, in human health. So what does it mean that ammonia is an indirect contributor to climate change? The graph or the picture on the left-hand side is taken from the IPCC guidelines, so from a very official document about uh, the global warming and, and the greenhouse gases. And it describes the origin of, um, of N2O emissions, basically. So N2O emissions originate from many different sources. So it's, uh, for example, starting with mineralization of soil organic matter, so that it's all related to nitrogen. Every process that um, releases nitrogen in the soil leads to N2O emissions. Uh, that means mineralization of soil organic matter. So organic nitrogen becomes mineral nitrogen. The uh, addition of crop residues and the mineralization of the organic nitrogen in those crop residues, the deposition of urine and dung from grazing animals, the application of organic manure, and the application of um, mineral fertilizer, that all adds nitrogen to the soil, which is then partly, to a very small extent, converted into a greenhouse gas uh, called N2O. And also the deposition of ammonia losses after uh, they have derived from, uh, for example, urea or from uh, organic uh, manure, they will, as I said, be deposited somewhere else. This is also simply an addition of nitrogen to the soil and lead to a certain amount of N2O emissions. In terms of the relevance, on the right-hand side, you can see an example of, uh, of a carbon footprint calculation for, for um, urea. So it's basically an estimation of the greenhouse gas emissions from one kilogram of urea nitrogen. And you can see that um, there is CO2 from the hydrolysis, so the product itself, the urea, contains some cert a certain amount of, of carbon which is released after application. Then there is ammonia lost from the urea and deposited somewhere else. That's the orange part, which also creates some N2O. And then the biggest part is the, is the green one. That's the direct emission of N2O after application of, of the urea nitrogen to the soil, so on the field where it is applied. And then also a little bit of the nitrogen will be leached, depending on the rate, of course, that is applied. And also the leached uh, nitrate can form some N2O. And then in, in the end, uh, the acidification of the urea needs to be counteracted by lime. And this lime contains, again, a little bit of carbon, which is also released as CO2. But you can see that the indirect emission through the ammonia volatilization is a significant uh, contribution to the carbon footprint of, of this um, fertilizer. Eutrophication. So now we are talking about the nutrient enrichment of ecosystems. It's about nature. It's uh, ecosystem damage. And you can see on the right-hand side uh, two typical examples of, um, of uh, natural habitats. So lichens is a certain um, form of um, algae combined with um, with fungi uh, that are an indicator for a very good um, air quality basically and they are they have a very low critical value so if the ammonia uh, deposition exceeds a certain level then these lichens will uh, will suffer and will um, uh, will disappear after a certain time so this is one uh, microgram per square meter, the, this critical value. And you can see on the left-hand side, 
that in certain areas uh, where we have high emissions of ammonia and high deposition rates of ammonia, this critical value is, uh, is or no, sorry, I have to say it's the green part. Uh, so in large areas of Europe, this critical value for the lichens, which is a very relatively low value, is already exceeded. So they suffer on large parts of, of uh, our continent. And um, on the bottom right, you can see um, a typical near to natural uh, meadow or a, a grassland, which is nutrient poor. And if the ammonia deposition exceeds a, a value of three micrograms, then also this by the biodiversity of such habitats will will suffer and uh, this can be seen for example on the on the map on the left hand side in the livestock rich areas like in the netherlands or the northwest of germany or in the uh, northern part of, uh, of of france and the, in Brittany, or the, or the poor val valley in, in um, italy so or every time you have a high livestock density with a lot of manure application and high emissions, then um, these problems with the ecosystem damage will occur. The main health impact of ammonia is through particulate matter to fine dust. And um, I've added here a quote from the European Commission uh, about Paris. And it says that when Paris air pollution levels peaked in spring uh, 2014, some 62% of the fine particles in the air were induced by ammonia emissions. So it was really the ammonia emissions that led to these air pollution peaks that were measured in Paris uh, at certain times. Of course, it depends on wind directions and all these things. So the ammonia need to be transported uh, to such an area uh, like, like Paris. And it, it originates from um, from agricultural areas, because uh, as we have seen, more than 90% comes from there and it cannot be created in Paris. It need to be, has to be um, emitted somewhere else, but then it's transported to these urban areas. Uh, the main problems, the direct impacts are negligible as the uh, table on the, right, on the left hand side says. So the concentrations are usually so low that there is no toxic effect uh, by ammonia itself. It's more the impacts uh, through the particulate matter formation to the, due to the combination with, with other air pollutants and also um, the odor, uh, the, 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 the smell can be a, a kind of um, annoying uh, thing related to ammonia. Okay. Um, there is one interesting study from... Uh, yeah, from a network of researchers and it, they published um, a book called the European Nitrogen Assessment and of course ammonia was also an important uh, topic in that exercise and there's one chapter which looked at the costs and benefits of nitrogen in the environment and uh, I would like to share with you some information from, from that chapter about costs and benefits. So the costs and benefits of reactive nitrogen, that means nitrogen that is chemically reactive, not uh, N2 like in the air. The benefits, of course, it's a key component of chlorophyll, of amino acids, of proteins, of enzymes. It increases the efficiency of photosynthesis to produce the carbohydrates. So it increases food feed fiber production. It's, it improves, improves the crop quantity and quality, for example, the protein content. And it's important for farmers because it improves the farm economy up to a to high N application rates, let's say up to optimum N application rates. But it has some costs. So there's a cost related to the impacts on the ecosystem, human health, climate. It can be measured and that's, uh, I'm, I'm not an expert in that, but um, it is measured in loss of life years. That's the human health aspect and loss of biodiversity and ecosystem services. That's more the ecosystem service, uh, the ecosystem aspect, the environmental aspect. Climate change um, is difficult to quantify or to express in, in terms of uh, monetary values, but in this study, um, this has been attempted. And what you can see here is now the aggregated cost. It's not the benefit, it's the cost of, of the reactive nitrogen. And what, what I found really interesting is the contribution of the different um, uh, emissions uh, that, that contribute to these issues of human health, ecosystem and climate. 
And um, the topic of today is ammonia, and this is the red part in this graph. And you can see that, for example, in terms of human health related costs, it's really the NOx emissions, the nitrous oxide emissions, uh, the nit nitrogen oxide emissions from, from traffic, from fossil fuels, and also the ammonia emissions from agriculture that create the largest uh, cost to the society. In terms of ecosystem damage, the main contribution is from uh, nitrate leaching, from N runoff, how is it called here? But then again, ammonia emissions and also NOx emissions are important. And uh, for the climate, it's only about the N2O emissions, and this all, or, or, of course includes the indirect uh, contribution of ammonia. But uh, what you can see here is that the estimation is that the climate-related costs are relatively low as compared to the ecosystem and health-related costs. But again, ammonia plays an important role. What are the options for improvement um, of this problem? So. The main improvement options are related to the use of organic fertilizers, since they are also the main um, source of emissions. There are already lots of measures in place, especially in, in the, in the uh, European Union, since we have strong uh, regulations on, on the emissions, as we will see. So, for example, improved manual storage and application technologies, as you can see here, um, lead to a reduction in losses. And of course, this uh, also applies to other organic nutrient sources, like for example, biogas, slurry, or vinas. Um, so it's all about covering, it's about injecting, so preventing that the gaseous ammonia, the very volatile ammonia compound gets in contact with the air and uh, has a chance to, to escape. If we look at mineral fertilizer, and that's our business, uh, then it's of course mainly about the nitrogen source and the efficiency of the nitrogen sources. So ammonia losses from different nitrogen fertilizers and cropping systems are very, um, very diff uh, different. And here we can see an example from, uh, uh, from uh, Brazil in corn. And um, the volatilization has been measured after the application of 100 kilograms of nitrogen in different forms. And the fertilizers applied were ammonium sulfate, so pure ammonium fertilizer, Yara Bela, which is an ammonium nitrate, and urea. Uh, and then we have um, a no tillage system and a conventional system. And you can see that uh, we measured in this case, or the, the authors me measured in this case, very high emissions, especially from the no tillage system. Um, since uh, it's, there's no incorporation, uh, it's, the, the urea is very much on the surface uh, and yeah, can be uh, lost easily. And I mean, the emission rate in this case is exceptional. So it's up to, it's more than 70%. I think that's the highest value I've ever seen. But emission rates under these conditions of up to 50 kilo, uh, of 50% 50 of the applied nitrogen um, have been measured uh, more than once. And um, the average emission under, let's say, tropical warm conditions of a surf surface plight uh, urea can easily be estimated at uh, more than 30%, uh, I would say. And you can see that depending on the conditions, the ammonium sulfate and also the ammonium nitrate fertilizers uh, have relatively low emission rates. This um, is another example of sugar cane from Brazil. And here we have compared uh, urea then urea with a uh, urease inhibitor, which is a compound or a substance that um, delays the conversion of urea into ammonium. And that um, gives the urea the chance to infiltrate into, into the soil uh, a little bit more. And as soon as it is a little bit deeper into the soil, the volatilization rate um, is decreased uh, quite a lot. And then we have Yara Bela again, which is ammonium nitrate. And uh, you can see the accumulated emissions um, over a period of 40 days. And um, yeah, what you can see is that the, most of the emissions occur within, let's say, one to two weeks. And uh, with the pure urea, it's already at 20% after about 10 days. And then um, the emissions increase up to 25%. With the urease inhibitor, this is roughly 
reduced by 50%, let's say. And with the Yara Bela, with ammonium nitrate, the emissions are very uh, low over the whole period of time. Of course, uh, you can see there are some arrows on, on top indicating uh, rainfall events. As soon as you have a very uh, significant rainfall event, like uh, the last one with more than uh, 45 millimeters, this will wash also urea into the soil and will stop more or less uh, the um, volatilization events. So it, it depends really on the conditions, uh, how much of the, of, of the nitrogen is lost as ammonia. One last example from, from Spain on a calcareous soil now. And uh, here we can see that also the liquid ammonia has very high emissions. Um, it's, a, it's a calcareous soil, so that means the pH is, is high, um, which leads to a high share of, of ammonia and uh, when, when it is in contact with, with the soil. And also urea leads to emissions of uh, 25%. And, um, and even with the uh, ammonium nitrate on, under these conditions, we measured, or the authors measured in this case, 10% loss from the ammonium part of this product of the ammonium nitrate, which contains 50% ammonium, 50% nitrate. Okay, so the choice of the, of the nitrogen rate and also the conditions and the management, whether it's incorporated, whether there's rainfall or an irrigation event, that is the important um, parameters leading to low or high emissions. A few words on regulations. Um, as I mentioned already, there are some regulations uh, related to ammonia emissions. The most international one is from the UNECE. It's a so-called convention on long-range transboundary air pollution. It's not only about ammonia, it's also about sulfur dioxide and NOx emissions and volatile organic compounds and some others. It's called the Gothenburg Protocol. And um, it's covering more than, than Europe. It's also covering some, um, some other uh, countries like Japan, Canada, US. Then in Europe, we have some European, some regional regulations like the National Emission Seedings Directive. And this uh, gives clear uh, yeah, limits for the emissions per country. And you will see it in a, in a second. And then we also have an um, integrated pollution prevention and control directive, which is more related to the in industrial production and the emission, emissions from, from industry. Of course, there are some other regulations in Europe uh, related to agriculture, which also affect uh, ammonia emissions. For example, the nitrates directive, which um, limits the use of organic uh, manure on farms, the water framework directive, which prescribes, uh, you know, which, which um, regulates uh, the, the water quality. Um, and of course, the, the, the nitrogen content in the water is one important indicator, and it's also affected uh, by the emissions. And of course, the common agricultural policy, which uh, prescribes certain environmental measures, which also have an effect on, on ammonia emissions. Look at the um, most relevant regulation, which is the NEC directive, so the National Emission Ceilings Directive. What does it say? So it gives, uh, or let's say on the left hand side, you can see how the emissions in Europe. Uh, look like so from 1990 to 2015 and you can see there's a slight decrease in emissions and we also had a um, let's say a revision a regular vision revision of of this directive in 2010 there was a certain threshold that should be uh, reached and and you can see that um, this value has been uh, reached, so that the target has been reached, but the value for 2030 is uh, much stricter. And you can see that um, the European emissions clearly exceed the uh, target value for 2030 given here in red. That means that um, there are some measures needed uh, to, to get to this value. And as always, this European target has been translated into national targets for each country, depending on the condition in the country, on the possibilities, uh, on the baseline, and so on. And you can see that the reduction targets are different for the different countries. Like, for example, in Germany, we have a reduction target of 29%, um, while in France, it's 13%. 
In the Netherlands, it's 21%. All over Europe, it's 19%. And the country emission uh, targets then uh, result in this 19% if they are reached. So it's uh, strictly regulated, and that means there will be additional pressure on farmers in Europe. But uh, I would say they are very much used to that. Um, when I say that countries have to reach certain targets or reduction targets, then this means, of course, they have to calculate their emissions and they have to report the emissions so that uh, it can be monitored or where they stand and whether they reach the targets or not. In order to do these uh, inventories, to make the calculation of the emissions, um, the EU provides guidelines, the so-called inventory guidebook, and this uh, provides a technical guidance to prepare the emission inventories. Um, and this, of course, includes also emission factors, for, for example, for the fertilizers, for the mineral fertilizers. And I've, they are a little bit disaggregated in terms of uh, the conditions. For example, depending on the soil pH, uh, they are higher or lower. But most soils, most agricultural soils are below 7 in Europe. And um, then we have some differences between the climates, cold, temperate, and warm. And you can see that for soils with a pH, uh, so normal soils um, below 7, the emission factor for urea, the standard emission factor for urea is, for example, at about 13%. Uh, for warm climates, it's about 16%. Um, and then we have different fertilizers uh, and down to the CAN on the left-hand side, which is calcium ammonium nitrate, which has an emission factor of uh, slightly below 1%. So that's how these national inventories are calculated. Um, the new regulation and the, the strict target for Germany that I mentioned before, so the reduction target is 29%, means we have to do something to reach that target. And one consequence of that is that straight urea is no longer, in principle, no longer um, allowed in Germany. And according to the new fertilizer fertilizing regulation, uh, straight urea need to be either immediately incorporated or need to be used together with a urease inhibitor. And um, immediate incorporation means that it needs to be incorporated within four hours. And in certain situations, like if you want to top dress a cereal, uh, there is no no chance to incorporate uh, the, the product. So it needs to be applied with a urease inhibitor or it need to be replaced by a different fertilizer type. Um, there are three different urease inhibitors uh, registered for use. So NBBT, it's the Agrotain, uh, well known and for a long time on the market, and then some derivates uh, out of that NPPT and 2NPT, um, which are relatively new on the market and uh, supplied by certain companies. Okay. So, in summary, um, ammonia is a colorless, volatile gas of nitrogen and hydrogen with a characteristic smell. It is the basis for almost all mineral nitrogen fertilizers, and it's estimated to feed around half of today's world population. Ammonia is emitted to air and contributes to air pollution, to climate change, to ecosystem and human health issues. Agriculture and in particular animal farming is by far the main source of in total almost yeah, 37 million tons of ammonia emissions globally. Ammonia is not a greenhouse gas itself, but it contributes as an indirect greenhouse gas to climate change. Ammonia and its reaction products lead to eutrophication, so algae growth in water, plant grass growth in, in land ecosystems and acidification of land and water. Ammonia and its products contribute to the formation of fine particles, leading to respiratory problems and um, health uh, diseases. The main options for reducing ammonia emissions are related to manure management, uh, but also losses from urea are significant and can be um, reduced by, for example, urease inhibitors or switching simply to another fertilizer. Ammonia emissions are internationally regulated in particular by the EU and ECE, and in particular also in, in the EU. EU. And uh, just one example, what this means is the new fertilizer, German fertilizer regulation, which even bans straight urea without additional measures. 
Well, and this um, I hope gives you a rough overview about ammonia and what it means to mineral fertilizer and what consequences are possible. And I would like to thank you for your attention. And I hand over to Carlos. Thank you, Frank. Thank you so much for sharing such an interesting topic. Uh, so uh, what did we go through the questions? Fine. Just, uh, just one question. Sorry? Shall I stop sharing or how do we manage? No, that? I guess that we can keep it like this uh, and then we can go through the questions. Okay. So I will go, we got a question from Brazil. In coffee, nitrogen-based fertilizers, MPK, is applied on the top of the soil, no incorporation. What are the recommended source for nitrogen? What losses can happen with different end sources? So it was about NPK, right? Right. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, NPK is very diverse. So um, NPK can, can be a compound NPK like our Yara Mila, and that is usually, uh, or not usually, it's always based on ammonium nitrate. Uh, and uh, ammonia losses from, from that product are, are very low. Um, but NPK can also be a blend, uh, a physical blend or a chemical, um, well, let's say it's uh, a blend uh, simply of, of urea, of straight uh, fertilizers, urea, TSP, uh, potassium chloride. <clears throat> and in that case, I would say the emissions that can be expected are similar to the emissions that we can expect from the straight products. Um, so I, I would say the recommendation is yeah, either to use um, an NPK, compound NPK based on ammonium nitrate uh, as we provide as, as Yara Mila, or it needs to be, for example, incorporated or washed into the soil if it's, if it's a urea-based product. Okay, and as well to keep in mind the soil conditions that will influence the whole system, as you mentioned, pH and so on, right? Absolutely, yeah. Okay, so we got another question from Argentina. Besides the regulations, ah, uh, it's here, besides the regulations on urea, on urea, use that in Germany has said uh, for the level of environmental impact that these emissions generate, would you expect more countries to follow this trend in the short time? Um, in, in Europe, definitely, because um, these targets that are mentioned from the national emission ceilings directive they are bind legally binding so um, that means if you don't reach them uh, in the end you have to pay for that so it's, it's really i think germany already had to pay for certain um, violation of, of such regulations not not for this one but um, for others and so, but that means there's really a, a legal um, component to it and uh, as you have seen, the, the target for 2030 is, is very strict. Uh, and depending on the country target that you have, um, this may also include measures on, on urea. And I know from, for example, Ireland is another country that has, um, that has uh, at least recommended to use urea with only with a urease inhibitor, because otherwise it will increase the Irish um, ammonia emission inventory. Okay, Frank. Thank you. And maybe I can just. Sorry, it it depends very much on the country on on the share of urea in the mm -hmm. in the country um, uh, mix. So if if it's high, then it will be regulated probably. Okay. Okay. So maybe I will take the chance to ask something. I, I had a question. Germany is kind of the country with the highest regulation and so on, as you show, but. Based on the map that uh, when you were talking about the, about the eutrophication, uh, we have seen that the highest concentrations are in the Netherlands, Belgium, and so on. What is the main reason? And if those countries as well, they are taking care or they are implementing local regulations to kind of control the, the accumulation and so on. Yeah, I... Um... I am not 100% sure about the 
<clears throat> the current regulation in the Netherlands, but it's also getting stricter and stricter. And there was even what was called um, a nitrogen crisis in, in the Netherlands some month ago before the corona uh, came in. And um, But it was really, they, they have, um, I think they hit some, it was more about the air pollution aspect and uh, and and the NOx and the and the ammonia contributing to air pollution and uh, so they are they also have very very strict uh, regulations. On the other hand, uh, the Netherlands, like for example, also Ireland, they depend very very much on their on their agricultural um, uh, production system based on. The, mainly based on on livestock so it's it's about dairy production about meat production so there is really a conflict um, between you know on the one hand heavily depending on on the um, on on this agricultural pro very productive and profitable agricultural business and on the other hand uh, complying with the regulations coming from uh, from from the eu so um, yeah so that means uh, depends a bit on the let's say strength also of the agricultural uh, community in the countries uh, how they um, how much pressure they will get from the regulation. Okay. So I have another question. I don't want to hijack the, the meeting, but uh, is there? So you mentioned all of those emission factors. How to calculate based on the source, the emissions, and so on. Mm, I wanted to ask you if there are institutions involved, companies, how do they decide or calculate that factor, basically? Uh, yeah, that's a good, <clears throat> good question. Um, there are, in every country has its institution who, is, um, who has to calculate these emissions. So it's usually, it's a a federal or a national agricultural research institute, um, which is responsible for for these uh, emission inventories, and then you have the environmental agencies uh, like the EPA's or um, in Germany it's uh, UBA. So there are there's always a, a national organization um, responsible for compiling these emissions. But the agricultural emissions are usually compiled and calculated by the agricultural uh, <clears throat> governmental um, institutions, uh, but these emission factors that are that are shown, uh, they are developed by um, by an institution or by by a, a group of scientists headed uh, by, by a Danish uh, scientist. <laughs> Nick Hutchins is his name, and <clears throat> it's it was really surprising to learn that this is a very small group, um, heavily under resourced, basically. Uh, that tries to compile um, yeah, these uh, guidelines uh, which have a, which have a tremendous effect partly on, on whole countries if they don't comply with a, with the emission reduction targets. So sometimes there's really a mismatch of, of how many people really work on developing such emission factors and what effect this has in the end on, uh, on, on a national uh, level. So um, it's, it's a relatively small uh, Group, it's a they, it's a it's a task force uh, which um, under the heading of the UNECE, which works on the development and the regular update also of these emission factors. So they screen the literature, they uh, look into new um, papers uh, published on on emission measurements, and then they they do a statistical analysis basically of all these measurements, um, and and convert this into average. Or emission uh, estimate, or let's say estimation models for the emissions. So they, it's not just one factor. It's considering a little bit the temperature, the pH, the nitrogen form. So it's a very simple model, let's say, that uh, leads to to the emission calculation. Okay, Frank. Thank you. I, we got a question from Mexico. As farmers or agronomists. What is the best way to reduce ammonia emissions, especially to avoid eutrophication? Um, yeah, so for, for, for a farmer, this emission is really 
significant uh, because it's so big. So um, if you assume that, for example, under tropical or subtropical conditions, you can easily lose up to 50% of your nitrogen if you apply straight urea to the surface and then there's no immediate rain, for example. That means you lose half of your investment. And um, I know that urea is, of course, uh, most, the most available product and it's also the cheapest product. But if, if that is all considered, then it becomes more expensive um, than, than it seems. Um, then, of course, the eutrophication is more a social um, cost. So it's, it's something if, if a farmer cares about the, the environment and, and nature, then this uh, comes on top of his economic loss. And um, I would say the the best measure to um, to prevent this first the easiest is to switch the fertilizer to a, to some to a nitrogen form that is that has lower losses like ammonium nitrate or ammonium sulfate if if the conditions um, allow, but that has other problems like acidification of your soil. So ammonium nitrate is a good solution in terms of um, increasing efficiency. Um, if he wants to use urea because there's nothing else available, then um, yeah, looking at incorporation, at um, applying before rain is forecasted, uh, that's something that definitely helps to, to reduce the losses because the main losses occur during the first week. So it's a matter of days. Um, yeah, that would be my recommendation. Thank you, Frank. So I guess that we can start to close the session. Um, basically, okay, first of all, thank you all for being here, for joining us. Uh, Frank, it's always a pleasure to have you here in Bula to have, let's say, that you share with us your knowledge, experience, and so on. You're always welcome. Uh, so I don't know if you want to, maybe a last sentence, last message for all of our audience before we yeah. the session. I would like to, to thank you. Um, although I cannot see you, I don't know how many are there and where you sit, but uh, wherever you sit and wherever you are, listen, um, all the best uh, during these difficult times and I uh, wish you um, good health and uh, take care. Thank you, Frank. The same for you. Thank you all. Please take care of yourselves, of your families and so on and see you in the next webinar thank you thank you very much bye 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 ciao ciao